I'm going to be talking about faces, something we have been missing and interacting with for the past two and a half years, I believe. So imagine this. Imagine you have some super cool tech which can track your eyes, your face, from your birth all the way up to here. If you then look at that kind of as a movie and try and spot the entities or the objects that you have been looking at for your entire life, what would be the most common thing that you would see? It would be human faces. So human faces is something that is hardwired for us to detect faces, to recognize faces, and to interact with faces. That's why when you look at clouds, you see faces. When you look at Mars, you see faces. You see faces everywhere. So faces are very, very important for humans to actually interact with. Um, and I'm going to be exploring how artificial intelligence helps us to do these things better uh, for, for, for the benefit of all of us. So let me start um, with an experiment, OK? So this is an experiment they do with babies. When these babies are first born, they haven't seen anything. What they do is they do a little experiment on the babies. So the first thing they do is they create this placard, which has got two eyes and a mouth. And what they do is they move this in front of the babies. And the babies start tracking this. The babies have not seen anything in the world. This is the first time they come and they see. And they start tracking these faces. So clearly, there's something in our brain to look for faces and to detect faces, to understand faces. Just to make sure that it is this particular setup, they also do a different experiment. What they do is they put the face upside down. So you've got the two eyes at the bottom and the mouth. And then they do exactly the same thing. What happens? The babies don't bother. So what it means is that we are kind of hardwired to actually look for faces, to detect faces, to recognize faces, uh, not just detect, but also emotions and so on. So it will be a very, very good problem to start kind of using a computer algorithms to try and understand and try to program. So this is kind of what we've been doing for the past 20 years or so in my kind of research life. I've been looking at faces. I've been using AI algorithms, machine learning, to try and understand faces. So first of all, recognizing faces. As I said before, face recognition, there are special parts in our brain to do face recognition. So it will be a very good problem to study. So I don't know, many of you probably know about AI. You have heard of AI. So how, does, how do we actually teach a machine to do recognition? OK, let's start with something very simple. Um, let's start with an apple. So you go a one-year-old. You show an apple to this one-year-old. You probably have to show probably just one apple and say, this is an apple. So the child will know next time you show a green apple or some other color, the child will know that is an apple. Very easy. You try and do this, teach what an apple is to a machine, to an algorithm. You don't need one. You need thousands and probably millions of apple shapes before it can even fathom what an apple is. So there's a problem here. So the, the thing with that is it's very easy for humans. So once you teach uh, the difference between an apple and a pear, the child will really understand. But for us to actually, to actually program this to a computer, it is very, very difficult. So very important for AI to be able to do this, we need two things. We need algorithms and we need data and lots and lots of data. So when we trained a machine learning algorithm for face recognition, we had to actually train it using millions and millions of faces before it starts recognizing. But once it does recognize this, it is actually very, very powerful. I'll show you in a minute. It's very powerful. Sometimes it's better than humans. So just to give you an idea of how we go about doing it, imagine you have a face. Um, so a face, how a human sees a face is very different from how a computer sees. So a computer will look at a face. First of all, look at the color gradient, the texture gradient, the shapes, and so on. And then what it does is it actually produces uh, a feature set, what we call a feature set. Now, these features are very different from how a humans look at a face. So these are called mathematical features. So 
what we tend to do is we actually then bring it down to about 128 numbers. So your face, my face, anyone else's face, the entire you know, world, we can encode just using 128 numbers. So the way it does is then, once it looks at a face, it actually encodes this through these 128 numbers and stores this. So it's a very, very efficient way of actually storing the data. So when you do recognition, what you do is you compare one face, you take the 128 numbers, you compare the other face, you take the 128 numbers, you actually look at the distance between those, those two uh, dimensions, 128 dimensions, 128 dimensions, and you look at the distance. And if the distance is closer, you know it's the same person. If the distance is far away, you know it's different people. So let's try and give you an example. So this very familiar face here. Now if you take N the face of the queen, okay, pass through our algorithm, we look at those, we encode it, 128 numbers, 120 numbers, we can look at the distance. Now the distance tells me that the similarity between these two images are 87.9% which is actually very close. So anything between below, anything above 70% is an identity match. Now you'd be surprised sometimes, for example, if I show you that face there, as alone, would you know that it's queen? Probably not, because it's so difficult. But our computer algorithm actually says the distance between these two images are 77.2% in terms of similarity, therefore it's the same person. So we know that with this kind of algorithms, it's actually very powerful. Okay, so that's all very good. You can, uh, you can create an algorithm, you can recognize uh, these faces, you can do the distance matching. But imagine you're given a passport for 10 years. By the time it's ninth year, you probably don't look anything like that. So there is actually a huge problem when we do this kind of investigation. Usually when we get pictures, they're like taking years apart. So it's very, very difficult to actually tell whether they, this is uh, you know, the same person. So you'll have to do more work. So we went ahead, we spent years in building another algorithm for face aging. So the idea that we had is take somebody's image, try and see what this person would look like 10 years, 20 years. Also, you can work backwards and find out what this person would have looked like in 10 years, um, you know, and so on. So how do you build this? Again, for AI, what you need is powerful algorithms, powerful machines, and power, lots of data. So what we did is we went ahead and collected loads and loads of data of faces of different ethnicity, uh, gender, and so on. And what we did was we fed this to the algorithm. And the algorithm came up with uh, a mechanism by which you can age. So we can then take a face and then we can age or de-age. So you'll be asking the question, how do you know your algorithm is good? So you can take a picture, a semi picture. I say, this is what I'm gonna look like in 10 years. Do you have to wait for 10 years to be able to actually verify this? No. As I said, you can actually de-age yourself and actually take an exact picture of you and then do face recognition between them. And this is exactly what we did do to actually make sure that the faces that we get are correct. So with these algorithms, we have got a very good, powerful setup by which we can do face matching for biometric purposes, uh, face recognition. So here's uh, a picture of me at 46, and a computer-generated image of me de-aged to 10. Uh, and again, you can do face recognition based on that. So we've used this for a number of kind of applications. Um, one is uh, for my finding missing people. In this case, we have worked quite a lot on different kind of you know, missing people, so trying to identify uh, what they would look like in the future. So here's an example of some of the examples. Um, the example that um, Herb mentioned is, so in, 20, um, in 2018, I was contacted by Bellingke. Bellingcat showed me these two pictures and uh, they were mostly interested in whether this is the same person or not. So obviously they had two different identities, two different passports, two different identities, names are different. And the question here is, is this the same person or not? 
So it's a very, very important case. So what we did was we took these two images and we brought them to the same age. So we brought both those images to 30 years and did face recognition using our algorithm. And we found out that the similarity between those two images are 97.7%. So that means we were fairly sure it's the same individual, although the person would have different names and different identities. And we also went ahead and we did um, a second suspect uh, of Salisbury poison case. Uh, again, they had two identities, two passports and so on, but we were able to, again, verify that he's the same person. In 2019, I was contacted by uh, BBC reporters. So this is an alleged Nazi war criminal um, who was given immunity in this country by MI6, and he stayed for a long time in this, in this country. But again, uh, BBC were actually looking through showreels and they found an image and which they suspected, and they sent me those images, and we were able to actually again verify this. So there's quite a number of cases where, whereby we, we, we are able to actually use this algorithm to do face recognition and, and to do this kind of uh, detective type work. We don't just stop on face recognition, we also go steps further, we actually look at how the face moves, how emotional profile of the face works, and so on. So we, we did a quite a lot of work in our labs in actually understanding the emotional profile of the face. So here what we do is we actually identify points on the face, how the points move based on that we can actually get all the basic emotions based on that we can actually do quite a lot of things. So here's one example. If somebody is smiling at you, how would you know that person is smiling genuinely or not? There are ways to find out. So here's, a, here's, a, here's something you should look for. You don't look at their mouth, you look at their eyes. Okay, the real smiles are in the eyes. When you see cross feet around their eyes, that is when you see the genuine smile. So here's an example, we can actually do this on the computer using algorithms very quickly and very robustly. So you can see, looking at the heat map, you can see the eye around the eye corner, there's red, so it actually lights up. So that's a genuine smile. So there are various ways, actually, we can try and utilize this to understand the emotional profile of the person while the person is interacting. Um, and the computer does it very, very fast, very quick. Um, here's another example where we did some work on identifying gender. So actually there is a difference between male and female while they're smiling. So we actually identify that. And again, this is very, very useful. Sometimes you might have somebody's smile profile, part of the face, so we are able to then identify people. We also did quite a lot of experiments on understanding um, lie detection. So is it possible to actually detect fibs by simply looking at your face. Um, so there are various, ways, various things you can look for lie detection. One is your blink rates. So there is a definite pattern of changes in your blink rates when you lie. Especially right after you lie, there's a flurry of blinks happens. So you can look for that on videos. There's also other things that you can look for, like asymmetry of the face. So if you divide the face into two halves, one part of the face might be happy, the other, part, the other part might be angry. So there's asymmetry of these emotions that you look for. There's quite a few things you can look for and try and identify. Lie detection, by the way, is not an exact science. You can kind of you know, hone towards a, a, a direction by which you can see these people are lying or not. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an indicative way of actually doing it. So as I say, Many, many things that you can actually use computer algorithms, AI, to learn about faces and to understand about faces. Um, here's my face. I'm actually looking through a patch on the, my forehead and using just the area, I'm trying to monitor my blood pressure. So again, this is a very cool way of actually, non-invasive way of actually understanding the face, is actually looking at my face. So as you can see, many, many areas from uh, detecting age to tiredness and trustworthiness. There are so many things that you could do. And for the past 20 years or so, I've been working in this field, I can see that there is a road by which you, know, you can start traveling so that computers and algorithms can really help us to understand the human face better for the benefit of humanity. Thank you for you. Thank you.
Okay, great. Uh, thank you for that, Professor. Um, I mean, it's such a fascinating uh, uh, area. So, uh, obviously, you've documented, um, I mean, there's, I, guess, I guess it's relatively well known about using these techniques for things like searching for spies and, 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 and other people. Uh, I guess, I mean, to me, it sounds like in, uh, things like Google Glass and it's, I guess it's more, it, you know, it, I mean, I guess from your opinion, it, do you see this sort of technology, if you will, crossing over into a mass, into a more mass um, uh, uh, manifestation, if you will, through things like augmented reality uh, glasses and things like that? It is already there, isn't it? So, for example, you you get into your bank account through your face. Yes. Yeah. So, these things are very robust. So, for example, face recognition, one-to-one um, -one face recognition is a sole problem. You go through immigration, you put your passport through, and you look at the camera, it lets you through, yeah? Yeah. Um, last time I went to Dubai, I didn't even have to take my passport out of my pocket. I just looked at the camera, and then it put my name and said, go through. You know, so that's how advanced kind of this kind of face recognition is. So I can see, you know, but there are still very, a lot of unsolved problems. So for example, uh, identical twins. I haven't seen an algorithm which can detect, you know, clearly between identical twins in terms of photos. So there are unsolved problems. But yes, in, in generally speaking, I think this is a solved problem. Wow, okay, so it's, to some extent the technology is here and I guess sounds like has been here for some time. It's more a question of um, how Fine the amount of time it will take to, for it to roll out, if yeah. you will. Um, I mean, well, I mean, I think it's one of the the I guess the, there's the challenge of the physical identification of the person. Uh, then there's this. I mean, you give a whole list of other things that you could detect by looking at one's face, including things like blood pressure, which yeah. I didn't realize was. Was was true, but I mean, I guess uh, a whole area around this would be, I guess, in what might be called sentiment analysis. Uh, and and I remember listening to um, a podcast or a, sh a show of, a, a, I think it was CBS 60 Minutes in America, uh, with a, a well-known Chinese AI scientist talking about a situation where, you know, in real time, teachers could be able to detect how bored the class is at yeah. any particular moment, <laughs> or conference organizers, yeah. perhaps. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I guess, I mean, that, that's, I mean, now, is that, is that going into areas where, you know, if you will, it's still yet to be established that it can work in, 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 in the field? Or is that actually also relatively uh, mature? It is actually happening. So, for example, I'm currently involved in a project where we are looking at um, people's voice, people's um, facial expressions, and trying to determine whether they're depressed or not. Right. I, it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward to do that if you think about it, because what we have is we have a lot of data of depressed people. So we look at their facial expressions, uh, how they sound, and what they say. So there's three modalities. There's the text, the actual transcript, yeah. the audio, uh, the pitch, and so on, and the facial expressions. And okay. we feed this data to a machine learning algorithm. Wow. And then we can, we can feed also the normal data, which is people who are not depressed. And then when you have a new data piece, somebody new coming, you can then test whether this person is depressed or not. So most of these algorithms, most, most of the things are there. I mean, in fact, if you think about the algorithms, most of the algorithms that we use for, for AI machine learning is 50 years old. Yeah. It's not the algorithms. It's to do with clean, clear, good data. So if you ha can have data, I think you can solve most of these problems. Okay. The reason why face recognition is solved is because as I said before, you know, we've got lots of phases, we've got lots of data points there. Yeah. So that's why it's such a good problem to solve and it's, it's been solved. Yeah. yeah, interesting. So one, one last question before I let yeah. you go. Do you, I mean, so I, I, in my mind, I'm thinking of a future, maybe thinking digital 2032, where many, many people, maybe most people have, whether it be glasses or I, I suppose even further into the future, contact lenses that are basically feeding information such as your name, you know, uh, are, are you, are you, are you, you know, uh, safety things. We're walking around, say, you know, uh, 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 you know, hard parts of a city where you, I guess, would be able to predict, is this person have bad intentions that's walking towards me, if you will, and things like that. Is that, is Pot that starting science fiction, science fiction, or? Well, it depends whether we can train an algorithm to, but potentially, yes. There could be a lot of other things that you could do. So, for example, 
identifying people, not just through faces, but also through, for example, you can identify people through the way they walk. Yeah. It's called gait analysis. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot of those things I think will, will come in, you know, okay. people identification. And, it, and, you know, face recognition has got a bad press because people, people think, you know, it's invading people's privacy. But I don't personally believe that is the case because it actually helps us to be safe, you know, in many ways. So, yeah. Okay. So there are those those issues, but at the same time, there are lots of ethical issues that we oh, need, to, yeah, we, sure. we need no. to kind of you know I've resolve. Yeah. Those for this, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, tech <laughs> tech can be tech is there, but yeah, you know yeah, you can't yeah. just deploy tech as okay. as and when you feel. Professor, so, thank, thank you very you so much. much. Yeah, Cheers. thank you. Thank you.